The Bible is a vast and complex text filled with countless stories of people from all walks of life. Some of the most intriguing and enigmatic characters in the Bible are those who said to have never died. These figures have captured the imaginations of countless believers and scholars throughout history, inspiring a wide range of interpretations. In this video, we will talk about immortality as documented in the Bible by exploring three men in the Bible who never died. The first man is Enoch. Enoch is one of the most mysterious figures in the Bible, as there are only a few verses dedicated to his story. He is a man who lived during a time when the world was in turmoil. According to Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, Enoch was the son of Jared and the father of Methuselah, and he lived for 365 years. However, the most remarkable thing about Enoch is that he walked with God. Then he was no more, because God took him away. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. To fully appreciate the story of Enoch, however briefly mentioned it is, it is important to understand its background of it. As we have seen, Enoch is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells the story of the first man's fall and how sin entered the whole world after that, tainting what God had intended to be one peaceful and pure place with iniquity and pain. Genesis chapter 3 outlines all the consequences that befall man as a result of the disobedience of their first parents. In chapter 4, we see the first murder happen. Chapter 4 is the story of Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. Several times in the chapter, the Bible mentions that the two were brothers, yet Cain killed Abel. It is as if the scripture is stressing how wicked and heinous it was for Cain to murder Abel, given the relationship that they had. This also goes to show the extent to which sin had corrupted the world, so much that one could murder their brother and not give much care about it, as seen in Cain's response when God questioned him. The Bible says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Chapter 5 of Genesis records the genealogy of Adam, and it is where we first see the mention of Enoch as a descendant of Adam. It is clear from the preceding chapters that Enoch lived in a very sinful world, yet in all that he remained pure. Enoch did not sin against God but he faithfully walked with him for over 300 years, during a time when the world was in its evilest state. His tenacious consistency with God is outstanding. Two other books in the New Testament give a fantastic testimony of Enoch. The letter of Jude refers to him as a prophet and warns against false teachers who have taken the way of Cain and perished in Korah's rebellion. Jude chapter 1 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 5 through 6 states, By faith Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found, because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch sought God diligently and walked with him. He did not walk behind God. He did not walk ahead of God, but he walked with him. He took every step that the Lord made and took a rest when he did. He enjoyed every part of the journey and God rewarded him for it. He did not have any special advantages over us. He was not divine. He was completely human. His amazing encounter with the power of God was because of his faith. It was a result of a lifetime of actively seeking his creator. Being intentional about doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. It was the fruit of the actions that he had taken all his life. The story of Enoch's life is a powerful reminder of the importance of walking with God. 
Enoch was a man of great faith who devoted his life to God, and as a result, he was spared from experiencing physical death. His example serves as a testament to the fact that those who trust in God and walk with Him will be rewarded in the end. The second one is Elijah. Elijah is one of the most important prophets in the Old Testament. His story is recounted in the books of Kings and Chronicles. Elijah's ministry took place during a time of great distress for Israel when the people had turned away from God and were worshiping false idols. Ahab was the king then and he had turned to idolatry. The true prophets were oppressed and killed and Baalism was made the state religion. Elijah's mission was to call the people back to the worship of Yahweh and to challenge the prophets of the false gods. He is best known for his confrontation with the prophets of the false god Baal on Mount Carmel, where he challenged them to a contest to see whose God was the true God. Elijah's God answered his prayer and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice he had prepared, proving that he was the true one. 1 Kings chapter 18. This event is seen as a turning point in Elijah's ministry. As the people witnessed the power of Yahweh and turned away from the false gods, Elijah proceeded with his ministry, performing many miracles alongside his helper Elisha. Elijah's story takes an unusual turn in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. At this point, Elijah already knew that he was going to be taken away. The Lord had revealed this to him. We see him strategically move towards the Jordan, where the Lord would come for him. The beginning of Elijah's ascension is at Gilgal. It is here where Elijah begins to deliberately separate himself from Elisha. He tells Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha answers, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two move on to Bethel. At Bethel, Elijah tells Elisha the same thing, and Elisha responds in the same manner. Along the way, many people ask Elisha if he knows that Elijah is going to be taken away from him. And Elisha responds by telling them he knows and asks them to be quiet about it. After Elijah's several failed attempts to leave Elisha behind, they both get to Jordan. When they get there, Elijah takes his cloak, rolls it up, and strikes the water with it. The water divides to the right and left side, and the two of them cross over on dry land. This is similar to the Israelites' crossing of the Red Sea during the Exodus, when Moses struck the waters of the sea with his rod, separating them and enabling the children of Israel to cross on dry land. After they cross, Elijah says to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha says. Elijah responds, You've asked a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they walk along and talk together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appear and separate the two of them. And Elijah goes up to heaven in a whirlwind. On seeing this, Elisha cries out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha sees him no more. Then he takes hold of his garment and tears it into two. He then picks up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and goes back and stands on the bank of the Jordan. He takes the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and strikes the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asks. When he strikes the water, it divides to the right and the left as it had happened with Elijah, and he crosses over. The men that had been watching proclaim that Elijah's spirit now rests upon Elisha. Elijah never tasted death, but was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire and horses. 
His life is an example to us of the power of faith. Elijah had great faith in God and was not afraid to stand up for what he believed in, even in the face of persecution. Elijah's life shows us that if we have faith in God, we can overcome any obstacle that comes our way and that the Lord will eventually reward us. And number three, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is mentioned in the books of Genesis, Psalms, and Hebrews. Melchizedek was a king and priest who lived in the city of Salem, which is believed to be the ancient city of Jerusalem. During those times, one could be a king or a priest, but not both. Yet we see him as both king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. Also, we read that Melchizedek meets with Abraham and blesses him, and Abraham gives a tenth of all he has. There is a lot of resemblance between the Messiah to Melchizedek. The book of Hebrews tells us that Melchizedek was a type of Christ and that he was without father or mother, without genealogy, without the beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. This means that Melchizedek was a mysterious figure who was not bound by the limitations of time and space. There is no birth or death date assigned to him. Psalm 110 references the priest king Melchizedek as a model for this Messiah when discussing a future Messiah of the Davidic dynasty. Melchizedek is made to foreshadow Christ, who is said to be the genuine king of righteousness and peace. As a result of this reference, which is why the author of Hebrews translates Melchizedek as king of righteousness and Salem as peace. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2. The parallel holds that Melchizedek-like priesthood of Christ is superior to that of the Levites, just as Abraham, the ancestor of the Levites, paid a tithe to Melchizedek and was thus his inferior. Moreover, Melchizedek's birth and death dates are unspecified in the Old Testament, just as the priesthood of Christ is to be eternal. All the genealogies recorded in the Bible have a birth and death date for every person mentioned, apart from these three men who never died. Because of them and the ultimate victory of Jesus over death, we have faith that we shall conquer death too.